Christian home, and it will give you a couple uh, housekeeping items. Uh, this Sunday, we will have uh, communion, as always. And the way we're going to do it this week is we're going to do it as a drive-by. Uh, so when we conclude our service on Sunday, uh, for those of you, whether you're a member or a non-member, uh, that want to participate in, in communion, and we ask that you would come to the church between noon and one o'clock, uh, and then we'll be there to serve you. Uh, you just drive through the parking lot, uh, you'll receive it and continue on uh, out the parking lot, and you can take it uh, when you get home. Uh, but that's one thing that we want to do. Also, we will be there uh, to receive the tithes and offering for those uh, that would like to drop off their tithes and offering. And once again, we'll be there from noon to one to receive those. We have to make sure that we keep our commitment to the church, our commitment to God. Uh, it's not uh, the, the fact that Reverend Davis needs your money. Uh, it's the fact that we're just being obedient unto God. This is what God requires of us. Uh, so we want to make sure that we still do that. Also, I want to let you all know, uh, Christian home members, and man, I miss you. Uh, haven't seen you in a while. I love you. Uh, I'm praying for you. Pray that you continue to, to take care of yourself, continue to, to be safe. Um, I, I've told many of you, just in case of those that have not gotten it, um, I understand what the governor said. I understand uh, that the churches are open. However, uh, we want to continue to practice uh, being safe. Uh, so continue, all of our members, to practice to stay at home. Man, just, just tune in, watch us, and then when God allows us to get back together, what a day that will be. Then we will really uh, worship God, rejoice in God. But one thing that I always tell us is that we have to understand that, that we are also the church, uh, that we can praise God right where we are. And so I want to let you all know that and let you know that I do love you, I do miss you. Uh, we will be here Sunday at uh, 11 o'clock our regular worship service, amen, then we will serve communion at noon, okay, amen, now we'll get to our lesson, on last week, when we looked at our lesson, uh, for those of you who are just joined, we're in Nehemiah, going through the book of Nehemiah, so today we're on Nehemiah chapter 4, but last week, we went over Nehemiah chapter 3, and in that, we looked at it, and it was just really a list of builders, and, and the point or the purpose is, how does that apply to us in our life? When you look at that, you look at all of those buildings that he listed, each one of them will put together a gate and a portion of the wall. Uh, the significance of it is, when you look at that, that is a picture of ministry within the church. That, that there are gates and walls that are, that are put up, but we need people to help bring people in. So when we look at that, you look at the fish gate, you look at the sheep gate, the old gate, all the different gates. These are just pictures of ministry, hospitality ministry. You need the hospitality ministry to bring people in the gate. When you're trying to get fish in the gate, we need hospitality members. When you're looking at bringing sheep in the gate, we have to go out and we have to have preachers to bring the sheep in the gate. You need deacons to help bring the sheep in the gate. And then when you look at the other gates, you had the valley gate, the dung gate. This is a picture of your bereavement ministry within the church. That, that you have people that have been in the valley, you have people that have been in the mess, and they need some people to help bring them in. And so therefore, when you look at those areas, these are just a big picture of ministry within the church. And the message for us in chapter 3 was that teamwork makes the dream work. That it takes all of us, all of us collectively, to, to make the, the dream work. To get ministry going within the church, it requires everyone to get to work. And in that, the first thing we looked at was it takes unity. We have to work together. We have to work together. Togetherness is a must if we're going to accomplish or achieve any goal, any task that's set before us. We must work together. Because unity, it allows us to combine our talents to improve the weaknesses part of it, as well as to better our strengths. 
If someone is weak, that's where we are combined, we are unified to help bring that person up. Second thing is we need humility. We have to be able to humble ourselves. Uh, we're going to make the dream work. We're going to make ministry work in the church. Not only should we work together, but, but we also should be humble. We should lay aside all of our egos, all of our desires for the sake of the whole. And that sometimes requires us to do something that we do not want to do. But if you want to make it work, if you want to be successful in ministry, it requires all of us to be humble. And then lastly, we have to be diligent in our work. We got to go at it with all we have. We have to do it the best. We have to work the best we can if we're trying to make the dream work. And the question that I, that I left you with is that we should not, number one, we should not be satisfied with mediocrity within the church. So the question that I left you all with on last week was, what are you doing to make your church better? What are you doing, Lord? Are you sitting on the fence, or are you doing your part? But in order to make it work, it takes all of us. Man. So then we get to chapter 4. Chapter 4 shows us and talks to us about facing opposition. That's, that's real important to know because whenever you begin to work for God, you have to know that opposition will be present. Whenever you make up your mind that I'm going to do it God's way, I'm going to walk in God's will, I'm going to do the things God requires me to do. You must know that opposition will be present. Now we have to also understand there's a difference between obstacles and opposition. Obstacles are things that are placed in your way. Opposition are people. And that's something that we have to really understand because Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that everyone that desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He didn't say that you may be. He said you will be. Whenever you start to walk for God, you will be persecuted. But the key is, in order for opposition to come, you got to first start working for the Lord. So in this, in this, we see when Nehemiah and his group started working for God, and in their work, they faced opposition. And so we'll look at these verses. Man, we're going to do it the way we normally do it here at Christian Home. We're going to do every verse one at a time. So we open it to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Now it came about that when Sambat had heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious, very angry, and he mocked the Jews. Remember, Sambat back in chapter 2 got upset when they heard about that Nehemiah and his group just wanted to help the Jews out. Now he's seeing that they are working and his displeasure has now turned to be furious and very angry. And out of anger, verse two says that he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria. And he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish it in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burnings? They, they started making fun of them and sarcastically asking questions. And, and, and giving them the picture of this is too difficult of a task for them to do. Verse 3, Tobiah and Rodolph joined in. And, and he joined in and said that, that, that the wall is so flimsy that even if a fox jumped on it, it would tear it all down. In the first attack that we have to understand is when you start to do the work for God, Satan has ways to come out and attack you. And this is what we see in this whole entire chapter, is how Satan has a way of coming up to attack them. In their attack, they start looking at them and making fun of what they were doing. But in this, what I want you to see first of all is opposition when it comes to our friends and normally fueled by emotions. 
It, 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 sometimes it, it's not what you're doing, it's how they feel about you. That's why Paul tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It ain't the person, it's what's working within the person, and that is their emotions. So sometimes people are just going to oppose against you just because of how they feel. They don't like how you look. They don't like what you have. They're jealous about the things that you're doing in your life. They, they, they're even jealous about how God is working in your life. And when they see that, their emotions cause them to sometimes ridicule and mock you. They want to talk about you. That, 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 that's all they start doing, talking about them, making fun of them. And, and in that, the next thing you see is opposition. The primary purpose of opposition is to attack your flesh. Because one thing we know, we, we know that that phrase says, uh, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never hurt. That's a lie. Because them words hurt. And, and when opposition comes, the first thing they want to try to do is attack that flesh. And how they do that is through their words. They try to attack you. And that's what you see here in these first few verses is they try to attack them with their words. And when they attack you through mockery, through ridicule, all they're trying to do is discourage the work of God. All they're trying to do is get you to stop. One thing I tell our church, you cannot stop the work of God. It doesn't matter how hard you try, you cannot stop the word of God. Also, what opposition does in their ridicule it is they cause you sometimes to question your own ability. That they'll, they'll, they'll plant that seed enough to where you start to question if you can even get the job done. Now you have to remember, when you look at this, these were not professional builders. Some of them were professionals in other, other occupations. And, and so they had probably had never built a wall before. And, and when you hear them talking about uh, uh, can you build it in one day? Do you even have the, the necessary equipment? Your equipment is not good enough. That then you start, doubt starts to sit in. And this is all opposition was trying to do, trying to get them to question their own ability. Also, what opposition does is it gets you to question your leadership. Yeah, yeah, it happens in churches all day long, every day. That, that, that you have people in there that just because the pastor ain't doing it the way that they want him to do it, they start to question, do he even know what he's doing? Yeah. Is he a good leader? Is he good enough for us to follow? We need to look. They doing something over there at that church. They doing something better over there. They doing something better over there. And we look at where we are, and we start to question leadership. That there is, that's just one of the primary purposes of opposition. Yeah, yeah. And, and the ultimate goal is to motivate you to walk away from the project. Right, right, right. That, that, that's the ultimate goal. Is that when they come in, we want to talk, we want to get you to the point to where you say, you know what, you are right, we're going to leave. Mm -hmm. That's what opposition does. But they don't want you to see how, how Nehemiah how Nehemiah handled the opposition. Look at verse 4. <coughs> verse 4 and 5, we see how Nehemiah Handle the opposition. Nehemiah prayed. He said, verse 4, Hear, O God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before you, for they have demoralized the builders. I want you to really look at Nehemiah's prayer because this is not a prayer that you would think that a person of God would pray. Because this prayer is considered an imprecatory prayer. And in an imprecatory prayer, this is one that invokes God's judgment on people that are perceived as enemies of God. You have to understand that because the, the Sam Ballad and his group in their opposition to the Jews, they were opposing the work of God. And because of that, Nehemiah prayed an imprecatory prayer. In other words, he prayed one of them sick them, Lord, prayers. Get them, get them, Lord. 
get him. Look, 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 look at his prayer. The first thing he said in his prayer is return their reproach on their own head. Everything they're trying to do to us, turn it back on them. Yeah, yeah some of y'all want to pray that prayer. <laughs> uh, then the second thing he said, give them up for plunder in the land of the captivity. Thirdly, he said, don't even forgive their iniquity. Wait a minute. This is, this is a forgiving, forgiving God. This is a loving God. This is an almighty God. And here, Nehemiah is telling God, Lord, don't even forgive their sins. You, you, you got to see that. Don't, don't even forgive their sins, Lord. And then the last thing he said, don't, don't, he said, let not their sin be blotted out before you. Why? He says, because they have demoralized your people. They've done all they can, God, to go against you. So instead, when he's saying, me and I just saying, Lord, sit them, Lord. Get them. Get them. Get them, Lord. And there are some other imprecatory prayers in the Psalms that I want you to see. A couple of them I want to read uh, so you can kind of see the difference in how it is. In Psalms, third number of Psalms, David is on the run from Absalom. And then when you get to that third number, verse 6, he says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Verse 7, he says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord, your blessing upon your people. David said, I'm not going to be scared because, God, I know what you're capable of doing. You'll be able to hit them in the jaw and break their teeth. This is an imprecatory prayer, one where he's crying out to God. Then you flip over to Psalms. <clears throat> Psalms 58. You'll see here in Psalms 58 where David is crying out for punishment amongst the people. There were some evil judges had taken over the land. And here in Psalms 58 starting at verse 6, David saying, Oh God, shatter their teeth in their mouth. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them flow away like water that runs off. When he aims his arrows, let them be as headless shafts. Let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along. Then this is one that gets me. He says, like the miscarriages of a woman which never seen the sun. He's saying, Lord, I want you to take care of them and just do them bad. In imprecatory, imprecatory prayers. Well, the question comes for all of us Christians today, how should a Christian interpret this type of prayer? Since it opposes what Christ said. Well, you know, when you go to Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said that we ought to love all of our enemies. He says, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and despise you. Well, well, how can we as a Christian today interpret this type of praying. The answer is real simple. That was then. This is now. Under the old covenant, they were allowed to pray this way because God was their avenger. God, the Father, was the king of the land, and they were his people. They were allowed to pray that way. But here we are. Now we are under what Christ has called and what Christ is teaching. And what he tells us to do is we're supposed to love all of our enemies. So how can we interpret that? As we have to understand that vengeance belongs to God. It is not even your job to try to get your enemy back. You're supposed to turn it all over to God. Y'all know some of y'all didn't want to hear that. Because you want to go home tonight and practice your imprecatory prayer. Some of you got a whole bunch of imprecatory prayers and people on your list. But, but, but what we are to do today is we are not to pray that way. We ought to pray for our enemies. Yeah. Man, but in this, Nehemiah prayed his imprecatory prayer, but then verse 6 says, after he prayed his prayer, they got back to work. It says that we built the wall, and the whole wall was joined together half its height for the people had their mind to work. But I want you to see in this is that the answer to ridicule, when they are ridiculing you, people up against you, what you're supposed to do, number one, is you're supposed to pray 
And number two, you're supposed to persevere. Take everything to God and don't allow the insults to stop the work. I don't care what they say. I don't care how they treat you. I don't care how many mount up against you. Do not allow the insults to stop the work of God. All right, one thing we have to understand is that we can conquer whatever the world throws our way through prayer and perseverance. We got to always, always continue to pray and then continue on in spite of everything that we're facing. We're not supposed to stop just because it doesn't look our way. We have to continue to go on. One thing I want you to see also in this is that it said that God gave the people the mind to work. In his prayer, Nehemiah was asking God to get the enemy. But in turn, what God did was strengthen the people. There are times you can be in the midst of a situation praying for God to change the situation. And what God does instead of changing the situation is he works on you. And he strengthens you right there in the midst of it. But you have to pray and then you have to persevere. All right. Second, when you get to verse 7, you'll see that Samvala and Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites, when they heard that the Jews kept working and they saw that things were being built, it said they got very angry. Mm -hmm. Now, early in verse 1, it said they were already furious and angry. Right. Now, here it said that they were very angry. Verse 1 was talking about Sam Ballot. This verse added not only Sam Ballot, but some other folk. Mm -hmm. that, that when you don't stop and you continue to work, that if they have a way, your opposition has a way of getting some other folk to join their side. And that's all they did. They created an alliance, an alliance to get after them. And they conspired to come against them and fight them. As the text says, and then to cause a disturbance, to make some confusion within that. You have to see that. Because they, they, they couldn't, couldn't discourage them and deter them with their words. So now the next threat is physical attack. We're gonna we're gonna put some hurt on. We're gonna put we we gonna go we we gonna up it up a little bit just so we can get them to stop the work. Now what I want you to understand and see also in this is that seven Valley were with the Samaritans. They came from north. Tobiah and Ammonites came from the east. Geshem and the Arabs came from the south, and the Ashdodites, which were Philistines, they came from the west. The picture to see is they're being attacked from all areas. Yeah. All areas. They are surrounded by opposition, and they didn't do anything to the opposition. All they did was doing the work of God. Mm -hmm. For some of us, that's a message. For some of us, that there are times you're not doing something per se to the individual. They just don't like who you're working for. Right. And when you're working for God, you have to know that opposition will come. And, and if one person can't turn you around, what he would do is he would go and get him an alliance of group with some other people to do their best to turn you around. Right. Then in verse 9, what Nehemiah says, in the midst of all this, here, what we did is we prayed to our God. And because of them, because of what we know or what they are about to do, we set up a guard against them day and night. Y'all have to see that because in, in his prayer, when we are praying in the face of physical attacks, is that, that we have to be spiritually alert against Satan and all of his attacks. All right. And the only way you can be spiritually alert is you have to pray. You, you have to be in connection with God. And how do I be in connection with God? I have to constantly keep that line of communication open, and that is through my prayer life. And I just have to let you know that if you are a Christian and you do not have a strong prayer life, you are a weak Christian. You must have a strong prayer life in the face of opposition. Secondly, you see that Action should always follow prayer, not be followed by prayer. Yeah. 
Nehemiah prayed first, and then he did something. But, but one thing that gets me about our people today is, is, is we always have a tendency of saying, I pray about it. Whenever you ask them to do something, and the, the, the number one response is, yeah, I pray about it. I, but, but the question is, after you have prayed, mm -hmm. what did you do? Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you can't say that I'm praying mm -hmm. to Almighty God and then don't do nothing. No, and I'm seeing here you have to pray yeah. and do something. Because our prayers do not replace our actions. Mm -hmm. What they do is they make our actions effective for God's work. That when I pray to God, what I'm really doing is I'm giving God permission to intervene into my situation. And I really believe when most folks talk about that they have to pray about it, you really ain't praying about it. But you already got your mind made up that you ain't going to do it. And you know if you talk to God, he's going to tell you what to do. So therefore, we really don't pray. But, but in this, we see that Nehemiah Prayed, and when he prayed, he got the people ready, yeah. and they were on alert yeah. just for any attacks yeah. that may come their way. Yeah. And the whole point of this is the only way that we can conquer the attacks of Satan is through a continuous walk of prayer and watching. You got to always be praying and watching. First Peter five and eight tells us to be sober, be yeah. vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. He, he is on the prowl, and, and, and what the text shows us is that as he's on the prowl, as children of God, what we should do is we should be alert. We should be watchful. You, you should always have your eyes open in the midst of attacks. All right, then we get to verse 10. Verse 10 gets me because verse 10 sounds like a bunch of us. Because in verse 10, you see where it said, then it was said in Judah, they start talking within. The strength of the burden bearers is failing. Mm -hmm. Yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild. The, the, the pressure got on them so bad, they started doubting themselves. They, they started doubting their own work. And then, to add insult to injury, verse 11 says, they heard the enemies talking about that, that we gonna, you won't even see us coming. And when we do come, we gonna kill you so that we can stop the work. Oh my, y'all have to see that. That, 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 that bad enough we're starting to die ourselves. That the pressure of the work is starting to wear down on us. And then on top of that, we're hearing rumors mm -hmm. that, that there's going to be a secret attack yeah. that's going to take us out. Right. Who don't that sound like a black church? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that when we, when we look, at, look at situations that, that we, we already struggling with the situation that we're in. We already struggling with what we're going through. We, we, we working, we all we at the church every Sunday, at the church every Wednesday. And then on top of that, we hear some people in the background talking negatively about what they're going to do to us and how they're going to stop talking to us and how they're going to gossip about us. All of this stuff weighing on them. Yeah. And you get the verse 12, it when they when the Jews who lived around, the, the, the close people around the area, Said they came to them and they told them ten times that they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. They heard the rumors, and now their own people are coming up telling them constantly, this is gonna happen. Your enemy is gonna come against you, your enemy is gonna come against you, your enemy is gonna come and attack you. And when you look at that, all that is is that is just just trouble mounting up on top of trouble. And what happens is you start to get discouragement from within. Mm -hmm. And when that's another attack of the enemy. And I believe that this is one of the most powerful attacks of the enemy is that he has a way of attacking us from within. Yeah. 
that he plants a seed in the midst of the people that we are working with. And, and what he does is he causes them to be discouraged. Yeah. You got to understand that this was a seed that was planted way back in verse 1. And when they start coming in, they tell them what they're going to do, talking about them. Talking about if you don't have the, the, the strength to build the wall. You don't even have the time to build the wall. You don't have the people to build the wall. You don't have the material to build the wall. And here it is later on down the line. They've halfway done the work. And now they're looking at what they have left to do. And they're complaining and doubting if they can finish the job. This is opposition's most powerful weapon is attacking the people from within the group. And what the way that he does it is he plants doubt in their mind. He has them to doubt if we can really do this. Is, is it even worth it to continue doing what we're doing? You have to understand the Jews, they were in a they were in a, in a, in a tough position. Mm -hmm. They were in a most vulnerable position because they had completed half the work. Right. And, and instead of them looking at what they have already completed, they were focusing on what, how much more they had to continue to go. And within that, they started to doubt. Yeah. Then they started to complain. Mm -hmm. We're working some long hours. Yeah, that sounds like a whole bunch of us. Ooh, the pastor always want me at the church. You always want me doing this, working on. We don't complain when it's extra hours at the job. But we only complain when it's extra hours for the law. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. I, I, I don't understand it, but that's that's that, that, that's what we do. We, we complain when we're working for God. That God is taking it. We're working. We ain't got to be at church that long. They, 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 he ain't got to preach that long. He ain't got to teach them. We don't have to go there two, three times out the week. One day is good enough. But we get up five, six days, go to work, punch the clock, sometimes stay over doing extra. But when it comes to the work of God, we start to complain and get discouraged. This is just, this is just a characteristic of the Jews throughout their history. They've always complained. Then on top of that, you had rumors, you had rumors that the enemy was going to come attack and it killed them. And one thing that we have to understand is that when discouragement comes, the, the discouragement is there, and what it will do is it will lead you to defeat. It, it, it'll lead you to quit. It'll lead you to throw, wash your hands, throw in your white flag, and say, I'm done. But as a child of God, what we should do is instead of quitting, we ought to draw from the strength within. There are some scriptures that we always quote, but when you face an opposition, you need to start living the scriptures. When it says, I look to the hills from whence cometh my help. If you know that your help comes from God, then when you get up on a hill that you're trying to climb, you have to look to God for your help. One of them we always say is greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If God is greater on the inside, when you face opposition, when, when troubles mount up, when pressures mount up, you need to draw from the strength of God on the inside. And there's another one that says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Not do it by myself. As what the world, what we tell society that you can do whatever you put your mind to. No, the scripture says I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Yeah. When I face opposition, when I start to doubt myself, when I start to complain about the work, when I hear rumors, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm just going to focus on the strength that is on the inside of me. And that is through God. Man, then now, Nehemiah is praying. They keep hearing about it. So now you see Nehemiah going to action. Right. You get to verse 13, you'll see what Nehemiah says. After I heard all of this, what I did first is I stationed men in the lowest part of the space behind the wall, the exposed places, and I stationed the people and families with their swords, spears, and bows. Nehemiah got the people ready. 
He positioned them in certain areas. And don't you know you have to understand that Satan will attack in areas where you are exposed, areas where the wall is low. And, and so what Nehemiah says, we're going to make sure that we strengthen those areas and we're going to put people right there. Then in verse 14, Nehemiah tells them that he tells them all to get together. And I like what he tells them. He says, don't be afraid. And he says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. That's the same thing David said in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And if I know God is my light, I know God is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And if I know that God is all of that, and I always testify to the fact that how good and merciful God is, Nehemiah tells them that when we get in the midst of that, just remember how great and awesome God really is. Yes. Yeah, that's a message for all of us. And even in the midst of this pandemic that we're going through, yes. we have to remember just how great and awesome yes. God yes. really is. Yes. And so Nehemiah tells them, don't be afraid. And that, 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 that should be a message for all of us in, in this world today. Don't be afraid of the pandemic. Just remember how great and awesome God really is. Yes. Don't, don't, don't be afraid of what the news reports say. Don't be afraid of the numbers that we see. Just remember how great and awesome God really is. And God is so great and awesome that in the midst of this, God will fight your battles for you. But you have to remember how great and awesome God is. That, that's all Nehemiah said right here in verse 14. He said, just remember that the Lord is great, he's awesome, and the Lord will fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Yeah, so you got you to keep remembering how great God is. That, that is the battle cry. That's Nehemiah telling you. That's our battle cry. It, it's that don't be afraid right now. Just remember who God is. Verse 15, Nehemiah said that when our enemy heard about all this, he said that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plans. He said, then we got back to work. That, that, that sometimes you ain't really got to go out and tell your enemies nothing. All, all you got to do is show them that you ain't studying them, you ain't learning about them. And, 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 and they will see that God is in the midst of this because they have not gotten to you. Yes. And then Nehemiah said, then and all this stuff, we just, we just got back to work. Yeah. But this is what I want you to see in these next few verses. Is I want you to see Nehemiah's plan of how they went back to work. That they didn't just get up and go back to work. Verse 16, Nehemiah says, from that day on, he says, half of my servants carried on the work while half of them held spears, shields, bows, breastplates, and then the captains were behind the whole house. Nehemiah broke the whole group in two. Half of them stood there guarding. The other half went to work. Y'all see that? Half of them went to work. Half of them stood there as guards. Verse 17, he said, Then those that were building a wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and had a weapon in the other hand. Yes. If they were ones that were carrying building material, whether it be brick, whether it be straw, whether it be mortar, we don't know what it would They had that in one hand, but they had their sword, their weapon, in another hand. Y'all got to see this because th th this is how a Christian fights opposition. You don't stop the work. You still keep the work, but you got to have something to fight with yeah, 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 yeah. in the other hand. Then in verse 18, he says, and for the building, he said, each one of them wore their sword buried at his side as he built while the trumpeter stood near me. Nehemiah had someone to stand next to him that blew the trumpet at the sound of an attack. But what he told the other people that were working, I need you to use both of your hands. 
So you put your weapon on your side, but then you still get to work. Yeah. Some of us in the church, God requires us to use both of our hands. Right. Uh -huh. And we have to keep, but, but you still have to have a weapon. And I want y'all to see that in this weapon, the weapon is the word of God. Mm. And the only way that you can fight opposition is you have to have the word of God. You have to have the word of God on, sometimes you have to put it on your side, sometimes you got to have it in your hand, but the point is you got to have it with you when you're doing the work. And notice, Nehemiah did not tell them to stop working. They kept working, they kept working, but they were prepared at the same time to fight. Again, verse 19, Nehemiah tells the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, he said, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. And he says, in whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us, our God will fight for us. You, you got to get that picture. Because he already prepared them, armed them for battle. And now he's telling them, just because we have a threat on the horizon, we still have to get the job done. That that's a message to the church. That this coronavirus is nothing but a threat on the horizon. But the church still got to get the work done. People that preachers, teachers, missionaries, whatever you want to call yourself, we still got to get the work done. Because the scripture said that the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. We, we still have to get the work done. Nehemiah said that whenever y'all hear the trumpet sound. He said, then we need to rally together. And he says, God will fight for us. God will, y'all gotta get it. God will fight for us. He did not say God may. He, he did not say there's a possibility. He said, God will fight for us. And you get to verse 21, he said that we carried on the work with half of them holding spears from dawn until the stars appear. And at the time, I also said to the people, let each man with his servants spend the night within Jerusalem so that they may be a guard for us by night and a laborer by day. Some of them work throughout the night. Some of them work throughout the day. But the key is they kept working. Then he says, so neither I, my brother, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us removed our clothes. Each took his weapon, even to the water. If they going to eat, going to bathe, they didn't even get unclothed. They kept their clothes mm -hmm. on. That means that they continue to be ready for battle. Right. And in this, what it tells us is how can we, as children of God, face opposite? How, how do we handle Opposition when people are coming up against us, when troubles are mounting up. How do we handle it? First thing we have to do is we got to meet that thing with prayer. Come on. You, you, you got to meet your opposition with prayer because prayer is your only weapon against the enemy. You, you have to pray. As a Christian, we should always pray. Paul said, pray without ceasing. Every day you wake up, you yeah. ought to be praying. One thing I told our church a few weeks ago when it comes to prayer is that we have to look at the idea of prayer. The idea of prayer is similar to a camel carrying burdens or carrying loads. And, 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 and the picture is that, that when the camel, when the, when the master gets ready to put the load on the camel, he has to tell the camel to bow down. And when the camel bows down, the master puts the load yeah. on top of the camel. And as they move about through the day, there are times that the environment, the, the weather, that it causes the load to shift. Yeah. And then the master has to tell the camel to bow down again so that he can straighten up the load yeah. on his back. And then as they go, when they make it to their destination to try to lay down at night, then the camel has to bow down one more time so that the master can take the load off of him. That's all this is telling us is that when you face opposition, there are times 
you just gonna have to bow down. And that your, your load may be in opposition, but you got to bow down and you got to allow God to adjust the load. But the key is when you get ready to go to bed at nighttime, you have to bow down and let him take the load off of you. That, that you cannot let opposition move you all day long. You can't let it worry you all night long. No, you got to bow down and let God take it up off of you. That's how we handle it. Opposition, we have to meet it with prayer. Secondly, we have to arm ourselves. You have to be ready for battle. That's why Paul tells us to put on the whole armor. Um, don't you leave nothing off. You got to put it all on. You need the helmet, you need the breastplate, you need the shoes. But, but the key is what you need is you need something to fight with. And what you fight with is you fight with the Word of God. We always love to say how we are more than. We're more than a comfort in Christ. Yeah, but when you go through God's word, it's more than that word, that passage in there that you can draw strength from. Yeah, a whole lot of passages in God's word that you can draw strength from. But you have to be ready yeah. to face opposition with the right thing. You got to have something to fight with. It's just like getting in the ring not knowing how to box. If you get in the ring not knowing how to box with no gloves on, you're going to get beat up. And, and that, that's how it is in this life. Yes. When you're trying to get into this ring with Satan, you can't go in there not knowing how to fight. And the only way that we can fight him is we have to get to God's word. Then lastly, you have to trust God for deliverance. That the, the end of this, that's why I said that we ought to walk by faith, God not by faith. Sight. It's not what you see. You have to continue to trust God. Because as a Christian, we know that our deliverance comes from what we cannot see. And what we cannot see is we cannot see that in the midst of what we're going through, God is behind the scenes working. And that, that, that's a message that we all ought to take home that in the face of opposition, we know that God is working behind the scenes on our behalf. Amen. That's a good thing to know. If I know God is working behind the scenes, all I got to do is trust Him. Because God has a perfect track record yes. of delivering everybody when they face some trouble. You know, Israel, when they faced the Red Sea, God delivered them. When you look at the Hebrew boys in the line, going through the fire of furnace, God delivered them. Daniel, God delivered Even when Peter decided he wanted to walk on water, and found out the water was too much. God delivered him. All of us. All of us. When we face opposition, we must know that we have to pray to God. That we have to arm ourselves for battle. And then we have to trust God. It don't matter how bad it looks, you still have to trust God. It doesn't matter if it's difficult. It doesn't matter if it's a hard road to climb. You still have to trust yeah. God. Yeah. Trust him. That's what, that's what Proverbs said. Trust in the Lord all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. But in all your ways, if you acknowledge him, he shall direct your path. Nehemiah is showing us that when opposition comes, you have to always pray. But when you pray, you have to do something after. Yes. And what Nehemiah showed is that they persevered and they prepared. They got ready to fight and they did not stop working. And that's what I want y'all to take home with y'all tonight is that in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of everyday life, don't stop working. Keep working at your church. I don't care what people say about you at your church. You keep on yeah. working. Doesn't matter if the job is difficult, you keep on working. Yeah. Do not get discouraged. When discouragement starts to come, just draw from the strength within. Yeah. And that is God. Yeah. And in all of that, God will see you through. And just remember, let me and I say, God will fight your battles. And Amen. shall we pray? Father in heaven, God, we thank you for your word on tonight. God, we pray, Lord, that as we go through this day, go through our everyday life, God, that when opposition comes, God, you, you, you touch our minds and bring back to our memories of God the things that we have learned on tonight.
God, that you would help us to draw from within, draw deeper and draw closer to you in our everyday life. Draw closer to you when we face opposition, closer to you when we're being ridiculed, when we're being mocked, when it feels like we're being attacked. Let us draw closer to you and lean and depend on you, God, that you will see us through. God, I pray, Lord, that there are some listening, there are some watching, God, that, that needs help in their prayer life. I, God, I pray, God, that you will go and touch them right now, God. Oh, God. If, if, if in the midst of their prayers, God, they will gain strength, oh God. They will gain confidence to know that we can face situations and know, oh God, that you will still be there. God, I pray for this world. I pray for our country. I pray for all of our leaders, oh God, that, that you would touch them right now, that you would strengthen the world, oh God. Touch us all, God, that they can give us the encouragement, oh God, to continue to get up day by day. We know, oh God, that it's difficult sometimes to stay at home, oh God, but I pray, God, that, that as we stay at home, God, that, that we would draw closer yes. to you, oh God, yes. closer to your word, closer to your love, closer to be, to gaining more knowledge, oh God, of just who you, who you are. So God, I just say thank you again yes. for those that are watching. Thank you, oh God, for those that are here, those that are listening. I pray, God, that, that they will gain some type of encouragement and strength from your word on today. But most of all, that we would take your word applied to our daily walk of life. God, I pray for all of our sickle shut in members here at Christian homes. Uh, Sister Turner, that you would continue to strengthen her. Sister Brady, Sister Ogden, oh God, and many others, oh God, that are sick. We pray, God, that you would touch them right now. Reverend Hawkins, God, we pray for his his wife, his sister, God, his sister-in-law, Lord, we know that they're dealing with the virus, so God, we pray that you would touch them and strengthen them right now. Yeah. We pray, oh God, that you would heal them in a way that, God, we know you can. Yeah. And Lord, we just say thank you for being God. Yeah. And one thing we do, God, is we want to praise you in advance for what you're going to do. Thank you in advance for the way you're going to heal. Thank you in advance for the way you're going to bless, the way you're going to strengthen us, the way you're going to keep us. God, we just say thank you. Thank you. We ask, oh God, that you hear our prayer on tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us. Amen. We ask that you would join us again on Sunday at 11 o'clock as we have our morning worship time. Amen. For Christian home, remember that we will have communion on Sunday in a drive-by format. Amen. You come through, you get it. Amen. That way we'll still worship on.